The African American Legends series highlights the accomplishments of blacks in areas varied as politics, sports, aviation, business, literature, and religion. We will explore how African Americans have succeeded in areas where they had been previously excluded because of segregation, racism, and lack of opportunity. I'm your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr., and with us today is Howie Evans, sports editor of the famous New York Amsterdam News. How are you doing today, Howie? Good morning, Roscoe, and I'm doing just fine. Thank well, you. Well, you write about black athletes, and there's a lot to write about, and recently, much of the major media has been demonizing some of our black athletes because of things that they allege to have been done. The question is, to what extent are black athletes held to a higher standard than white athletes, and to what extent is this due to the media bias? Well, uh, I'm not sure they're held to a higher standard. I'm, I'm almost positive that there is a tremendous degree of racism in terms of how they deal with a black sports celebrity in lieu of other, other, other celebrities. Now, how is that um, reflected? Well, it's, it's, it's reflected in this way. Um, you, take, you take all of the, all of the Hollywood celebrities, you take the local people here, here in the city of New York and the state of New York, uh, who may not be, be Hollywood celebrities, but who are very famous people. For instance, when Madoff uh, was involved in that big financial scandal, and all, where he's, which he's serving time now, you never ever saw him go into go into any of these uh, hearings with his hands cuffed. Mm -hmm. Never. When Plaxico Burris turned himself in, he didn't. The, the police didn't have to go looking for him. He walked into the station, and when he walked out, they had him cuffed. And there were two burly policemen walking next to him mm -hmm. as if he was going to try and escape. But they were looking more for a photo opportunity for themselves. The other part of that is the very first thing that the mayor of New York City, Michael Bloomberg, said is that uh, we're going to prosecute him to the highest. Mm -hmm. The former Attorney General, uh, what's, what's his name? Mo Morgenthau. Uh, 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 Morgenthau. He said two months before he left his office is that if it's the last thing I do, I'm going to see that he ends up in jail for many years. Now, here's a guy who had a permit for the gun that he was carrying, and, and it was wrong. No one, no, you know, we're not, we're not defending that. The gun was, was, had a permit, but it wasn't, he didn't have a permit for the state of New York. Shot himself and, 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 and all. So now, here's Plaxico Burris, who got something like two and a half years, three years in jail. He's been trying to get out of jail on good behavior, and so forth. When the holidays, the last holidays, Thanksgiving and Christmas rolled around, he asked if he could get released for a day to spend time with his family. They wouldn't let him. In the meantime, some of the so-called illegitimate people who are involved in crimes who are also imprisoned were released almost the uh, identical time that he requested. Now, these were guys who had committed murders mm -hmm. and all. So he, he, to me, is the most glaring case of, 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 a, of a black sports celebrity who has literally done nothing, who mm -hmm. is serving three years in time. Well, is, is this a message of trying to keep them in their place? Is that what that's about? It, it, it may well be. Uh, the, me the media in this city feeds off, off, off sports and, 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 and the lives that they pursue off the field of play. And if a black athlete stumbles, he's going to feel the t entire wrath of the media in this city. But the same thing could be true of a white athlete. Uh, it so happens that the sports are dominated here in the city and nationally by black athletes, 
But do you think the media would treat a white athlete in the same way? No, absolutely not. Well, I think they were pretty hard on Lance Armstrong. Well, yeah, they were but, pretty hard on Roger Clemens. But he has first, first. They 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 embraced Roger Clemens from 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 almost near the beginning until they started writing a series of stories, and then when he went to Congress and they knew that he had lied, and and and, and all. But up to then, he had kind of been treated with kid gloves. Lance Armstrong is really not a native of New York, and and and. He is still out peddling around the world, mm -hmm. although he's been involved probably more so in drug activity, supposedly and allegedly, than Roger Clemens. Mm -hmm. Well, there is a different standard, clearly, a different standard for African Americans than most things. But let's look at African American college athletes. At one time when you and I were coaching and involved in college, it wasn't a question of was an athlete going to be graduating? It was a question, when would he graduate? Would he graduate in June or at the end of the summer? Now, the new regulations, a uh, athlete can go into college for a year and do well and get a million dollar contract and not even think about school. To what extent are the colleges complicit in this as well as the professionals? I don't think the, the colleges really care one way or the other as long as they can continue to get their massive amounts of money derived from sponsorships of their local teams, monies that come in from the NCAA and, and, and all. But in the other part of your question, 95% of the black athletes in this country who go to college graduate. That's the first thing. Mm -hmm. If we figure in just the just the athletes who go to the Big Ten, mm -hmm. the ACC, or those guys who make All-American, it's, it's a, a very minute percentage. If you take all of the black athletes who go to Ivy League schools, they all graduate. And the ones who go to black colleges. And the ones who go to black colleges, they all graduate. So this figure is blown up into the few black athletes who jump from college to go to the NBA. That, that, that's a very small percentage of, 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 of black mm -hmm. athletes who attend colleges, and it's unfair mm -hmm. to keep, for people to keep s stating that these black kids are not graduating, because I hear so many black educators say the same thing. Mm -hmm. But they're focusing on the high profile, maybe two black athletes from a mm -hmm. school who achieved the status of being able to leave school ahead of time. Well, there are some colleges like Penn State and Notre Dame that have a very high graduation rate, and that's because they put an emphasis on athletics, on the academics. But there are some colleges, uh, even when the athletes stay in school for four years, they do not graduate. And that's because they do not give them the support, because many of them go into college with low academic performance initially. So what can we do to get colleges to support athletes more with academic pro programs? Well, the most important thing is this. Take a program like, say, say Memphis. They, ha they had four kids who were all underclassmen that were recruited by Calipari, you know, knowing that they were going to leave. They left. All four of them left with three and four years left of, of college eligibility. And, and, and all, so this 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 is like uh, 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 for 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 Calipari, if he can if he can get the cream of the crop recruits every year, and maintain his twenty five and thirty wins every year, then no one is complaining about that. They're not they're, no, no one is going to say, well, these guys are not graduating. They they, they don't care because in, in many ways, sports like uh, some parts of basketball and football are really minor leagues for the professional leagues. And somebody like Kyle Perry, he's a coach of a minor league professional team. And because it's associated with a college, he gets a good salary. That doesn't seem to be consistent with the idea of sports helping the people to grow up and become full-fledged citizens. And it doesn't seem to be consistent with the academic mission of a college. When you have a pro team, you know you're going to bring in people for a year and then leave, uh, that seems to be a distortion of the purpose of academics and athletics. There are some, particularly divisions, 
three schools and many black schools that have a good balance between that. What can we do to get more of that balance? I, I don't think you can get more of that balance unless you start paying these guys. Unless you pay the athletes? Yeah, yeah. Now, why, why not give them? For, first of all, there's a tremendous imbalance between athletic scholarships and educational scholarships. We're talking about, for instance, in basketball, 15 kids who get scholarships. There's this tremendous outcry among educators across the country who are involved in, in uh, who, who are at these big windmill colleges and all. They're hypocrites because when you look at the literally thousands of kids who are at, at a Penn State or at a, at a, at a data, data, data school where they have an enrollment of 60,000 kids and all, and you might have 20,000 kids on scholarships who have nothing at all to do with athletics at all, but yet the focus is on these 15 kids who they all say are, is getting a free ride. Hmm. Well, that's not, that, to me, well, it's very your, hypocritical. Your solution is to pay the athletes, um, all of them or just the top ones? Or how would you do that? No, I, I think that to, to encourage these kids to stay in school, and I don't think that's, I just think that's a stopgap solution anyway because hmm. I don't think that's going to happen because we only have this, this problem in, in, in basketball and, 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 and football to a, to a certain small degree, football. Football is not like basketball where they're dealing with over 100 kids, so you don't have 100 kids leaving, co leaving, leaving a, a major college football program to go to the NFL. That's not happening. Because the NFL has rules, they don't take them. Yeah, but the rules, the rules are so hypocritical, Dr. Mm -hmm. Brown, hypocritical in, 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 in this way. They say that an athlete, a college athlete, who say is at the University of Kentucky, has to be in college for one year according to NBA rules. Mm -hmm. Now, take this one year now. Now, you have been part of collegiate athletics all your life. Mm -hmm. You know that a kid signs, signs up and he's in class. The first semester, he don't go to class, right? And nothing happening except he's going to be put on probation for the second semester. Mm -hmm. These kids don't go to class. They don't go to class because they know that nothing is going to happen to them mm -hmm. because they know that they're going to spend one year representing this university mm -hmm. with not any repercussions because they, none of them are but going it, to class. It, don't the colleges have some responsibility for of that? Of course they do. They could stop that. They could stop that at, right away by telling the coaches, you can't recruit these kids. Mm -hmm. Or you if know? they do recruit them, make sure that somebody yeah. even babysits yeah. them, walks them to class. Yeah, make sure they go to class for that one year. Mm -hmm. And if they miss class, they miss, if you miss a class, you miss a game. Mm -hmm. Simple solution mm -hmm. to me. You know, you miss a class, you miss a game. Yeah, well, what will happen, as you know, everything is evolutionary. Well, college athletes started as a diversion for the students. And then eventually the alumni got involved in it and eventually became a minor league for professional teams. At some point in time, I believe they'll just have a minor league composed of colleges. And they will pay the players and they probably won't even have to go to, go to class. It's almost at that point now. And I think the society is not ready to face the hypocrisy of saying that they are real students representing the But you remember now, Years and years ago, Doc, years and years ago, you had football players staying in school for five, six, seven years, mm -hmm. right? That's you right. remember that. But they did get a degree. They did get a degree, and they were paid. Yeah. And they got paid. Yeah. Under uh, the table. Under the table. Yeah, they got paid. So we're not talking about anything that's really new here. You know, we're talking about something that is just on a more higher scale. Yeah, one of the things we try to do on this program is to get people to thinking about these issues. And now another issue that we're concerned about with African Americans in sports is ownership, head coaching, top uh, jobs on the staff. Uh, you look at the sidelines of some of these uh, sports teams, all the assistants, or most of them are black, and the head coach is white, the athletic director is white. Not that white people don't have the ability to do this, but they are at least 
at as many African Americans to do this, and if you have 85% of your players African American and 50% of your coaches uh, assistants African American, it seems to me that at least 40% of you head coaches ought to be African Americans. And similarly, in the business sector, you ought to be able to invite in people who have money to become uh, supporters or owners of the team. How do you think we can address that? Well, I call that the sports slave mentality because at 95% of these, these colleges, and I'm talking about the major colleges because this doesn't happen at Division Three and to a degree at Division Two. We're only talking about really the major colleges where, where they have 95,000 people at these football games. And Michigan so had 113,000 people. And it sold out for 10 years. And that's you can't amazing. get a ticket. Now, of course, I like to ask you, well, why, why do people do that? Why do they spend money to come to a game on Saturday? What do you think? Because the, most of the people who do it are people on the lower wage scale of life. And, 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 and these, these small cities around the country become tremendous cities on football Saturday. That's true. You know, mm -hmm. so this is, their, this is their way of life. Mm -hmm. Instead of going out to the bars or going here, they spend their monies on these schools to go to the football games, 95% of them are beer. not college graduates and drink beer. <laughs> you know, 95% of them have never, never ever been to college That's at, very at, at all. But, but Michigan prides itself when they say 30,000 or 40,000 alumni come to those games. They probably do. They, they, they probably yeah. do, you know. But the stadium seats over 125,000 yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah. It's a big so stadium. you still have a tremendous disparity mm. in the number of people who may have graduated mm -hmm. or went to college in opposed to those who never went to college. All right, going back to the question about uh, getting more blacks into head coaching and ownership and the athletic director positions, how, how do you think we could approach that? Well, I, lo I, look, at, I, I look at the various uh, pro sports leagues and I, and I, and, and I I'm almost sure that they kind of feed off of what happens with the NFL and Major League Baseball and, and the NBA. They kind of feed off of that. In college, it's become very important at the major schools because now all of the top talent, for, for, for a large part, are all African-American players. So it makes sense to them in their thinking that when they go out recruiting that these black assistant coaches can relate better to the athletes that they're recruiting. And very often, they find out quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's not really true. Mm -hmm. Because if a guy can't recruit, it doesn't matter what color he is. Mm -hmm. If he can't recruit, if he can't get his message across, if he can't deliver these kids to these schools, he's not going to keep his job. Mm -hmm. I don't care what kind, how great this assistant is. If that guy goes out and they, have, and they have, have pinpointed the top 100 recruits in the country, you know, he better come in with three or four of those guys, <laughs> <laughs> you know, on a regular and consistent yearly basis. He better come in with three or four of those guys. But how does that translate in helping them to become head coaches and athletic directors? It, it doesn't because the majority of them never even reach that level. It's mm -hmm. only an isolated few now, who ever reach that level. But it, it seems to me on just the basis of random numbers, the large numbers of African-American assistant coaches, there'd be a larger number who would get into being head coaches. Uh, uh, there seems to be a certain amount of nepotism where you pass this on, Bobby Bowden passes on to his son and so on. It, uh, how do you break that? Well, I break it down into the social atmosphere of our country in, in, in that most, most owners feel more comfortable when they are out amongst their friends, and many of them who, by the way, are not sports people, they're industrial people, they're involved in businesses and so forth. So they feel more comfortable relating to a white head coach than a black head coach. And when you go to these major schools, 90% of your application in, 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 in trying to get these jobs depends on, first, how you relate to the search committee. 
-hmm. who, by the way, most of them are 99% white. Mm -hmm. So first you got to relate to them. You got to make them understand that you want to maybe act like a white guy. Mm -hmm. You know, so now... What does act like a white guy mean? Well, t adopt their ways, go to their social gatherings, mm -hmm. and, and, and so forth. And, and all. Mm -hmm. Then you have, to, you, you have this committee says, well, do you think that he would be a comfortable fit? Mm -hmm. That's the key, two key words, a comfortable fit. Mm-hmm. Now, a comfortable fit takes it completely away from the sidelines. Mm -hmm. I don't care how good this guy is. If they don't feel that he's a comfortable fit, he's not getting that job. Mm -hmm. Now, does the comfortable fit translate into being a good coach? No. Why? Be because the coach very often is so under the gun. He's so concerned about how he's relating off the field and how he will be perceived mm -hmm. and relating to his athletes on the field makes it a very difficult uh, uh, task for, for most mm -hmm. of these guys because we don't have this kind of pressure on, on, on a white head coach. The pressure mm -hmm. is entirely different. His pressure is trying to win football games and, 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 and all. The black coach has to be, be concerned about how am I going to relate to these, to, 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 to the to the white folks who are spending the money, who are mm -hmm. paying for, 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 for these seats and, and, and who are helping to bring these athletes here. And don't forget that most of these alumni associations hire the coaches mm -hmm. at all. So 95% of them are not going to hire a black coach. But in many universities, they have large numbers of African-American alumni. If they got together and put some pressure, wouldn't that cause those colleges to say, look, we got to be more equitable in providing opportunities? The African-American alumni haven't been very outspoken on this yet. Well, I don't think that it's, it's, it's like two different worlds. When, 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 and you can see that developing when you're on a college campus, you know, and I spent many years on these campuses where you will see where the white athletes will, st will hang out together and the black athletes will hang out together. I mean, when I was coaching up at Fordham, I, 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 you know, it was very visible to me because I pay attention to these things, mm -hmm. how, where are these kids going, who they're with. So, and you could see the, they were all great friends and many of them remain lifelong friends, but there becomes a barrier and the barrier is socializing. Mm -hmm. Now, are you going to take these guys into your homes? Are you going to take them out to the country clubs? And for the most part, the answer is no. Mm -hmm. So there becomes a tremendous division on, on that level. And, and then it kind of ekes out when you leave school and then you go into the professional world. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's and always... Into the coaching world as and well. And the coaching world, yeah. So, so you, 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 have this, you, you have this division of, of people and, and how they're going to live, where they're going to mm -hmm. live. But I think the media has some responsibility to keep, continue to point out this disparity with large numbers of African-American athletes and assistant coaches and very few head coaches. And there are some writers in the media who have taken this on, uh, you among them. So I think it's important to continue to bring that issue to the public and help them to understand it, because clearly African Americans have the same ability to do anything that anybody else does if given the opportunity. Without question. Uh, I mean, that's been proven <laughs> over and over mm -hmm. again. And the key word is, like you just said, given the opportunity. Mm -hmm. and, and without an opportunity, there can't be success. Mm -hmm. So when, 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 when I see, like, 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 uh, Take the, the New York Mets situation with, 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 with Jerry Manuel. All season long, he's had to deal with these rumors about Bobby Valentine, yeah. the great Bobby Valentine. But what has he ever won? Yeah. And a lot of people you, in the media have brought that up. Yeah. As we come to the close of the program, I want to ask you something that you haven't thought about, but I want to make you think about it. Name the five greatest African-American athletes in American history. Jim Brown. Jim Brown, okay. Rayford Johnson. 
Rafe Johnson, okay, the Kathleen. And and he did, you know, he, you know, he, 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 there were other things uh, that that he did. Um, the third, the third, uh, the third one would 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 be Althea Gibson. Althea, you, because, I was just thinking that. Very good. Not only was she, people don't realize that she was a hell of an athlete yeah, right. at Florida A and M. And your next one. The next, the, the 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 next one, would 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 uh, would 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 be uh, oh gosh, what's what's uh, uh Bo Jackson. Bo Jackson. Who who had he concentrated on baseball? And and the last one would be. The last one, who would who would who would be the last one in 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 that top five? Um, All right, we've come to the end of the show. We let the audience decide what the last <laughs> one will be. Today on African American Legend, we've been talking with Howie Evans, sports editor of the New York Amsterdam News. Thanks for being with us today, Howie. You're quite welcome. <laughs>